Uh, welcome everyone to another MSA online panel discussion, the second in our series. <clears throat> My name is Jason Brown. I'm the president of MSA, Mid-South Sculpture Alliance. I also teach sculpture at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. I have a few um, uh, announcements to make before we get started and before I turn over the mic to our moderator. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background about MSA, if you're not familiar with the organization, it, we are a nonprofit founded in 2006. Um, we are committed to the advancement of the creation and awareness of sculpture uh, in its many and varied forms and promote a supportive environment for sculpture and sculptors. Uh, the Mid-South Sculpture Alliance seeks to advance the understanding that sculpture educates, affects social change, and engages artists, art professionals, and the community in dialogue, as we're doing tonight with this program. Uh, we en encourage all of you viewers to consider becoming MSA members. Uh, we are a national organization, not bound by geographic limitations. Uh, at the second half of this evening's panel discussion, we'll be taking questions from um, viewers on Facebook, and I will be helping to facilitate um, ask some of those questions on your behalf. I also want to thank our technical support staff and board members who are working behind the scenes tonight, Stacy Holloway, Stephanie Loggins, and Beggs McKelvey. Tearing down monuments, our panel discussion tonight um, I, is the second in, in our series uh, of online panel discussions. During this challenging time of COVID-19 pandemic, MSA decided to shift some of our programming uh, online, uh, especially after we had to make the difficult decision to postpone our fall conference, which was scheduled uh, at the University of Cincinnati. That, however, will be happening again uh, in 2021. It'll, uh, we haven't set the date, but it'll be fall 2021. So stay tuned for that uh, exciting event that's coming up a year from now. Um, before we start tonight's discussion about tearing down monuments, I have a few announcements about upcoming artist opportunities that are sponsored by MSA. Um, sorry, here we go. Uh, the first um, is in partnership with the city of Lexington, Pam Miller Downtown Arts Gallery. MSA is excited to be presenting um, our second annual uh, indoor professional sculpture exhibition in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, this features the work of our members. And this year we're very uh, excited that our juror will be the distinguished artist, Alicia Henry, who teaches art at Fisk University in Nashville. The theme of the exhibition is House on Fire and the deadlines for submissions is October 12th. Awards will be presented to artists with a top prize of $500. Please see the MSA website for details and the entry form. Again, October 12th, is the deadline. Um, another um, new and exciting opportunity that we've created um, is this Vision 2020 grant. Uh, we are planning to award grants of $2,000 to Black, Indigenous, and artists of color to support sculpture projects. The deadline is October 31st, so you have about a month to apply for this. Submissions will be reviewed by three esteemed curators, Dr. Kimberly Gant, of the McKinnon Curator of Modern uh, and Contemporary Art at the Chrysler Museum of Art, uh, Miranda Kyle, who's also one of our panelists this evening. Uh, Miranda is Arts and Culture Program Manager for the Atlanta Beltline. And Nandindi Makrandi Justice, who is Chief Curator at the Hunter Museum of Art in Chattanooga. Again, details for this uh, can be found on the MSA website. Finally, the panel discussion this evening will be recorded along with audience questions as a part of the Q&A during the second half of the discussion. And this recording will be available for future viewing on Facebook archives and the new MSA YouTube channel. Also, uh, we just wanted to state the following disclaimer. This program this evening does not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Mid-South Sculpture Alliance, its staff, board, partners, or membership, or the organization's institutions or galleries that we're affiliated with unless otherwise stated. Finally, I have the honor of introducing our moderator for this evening's panel discussion, Isaac Duncan, 
who is our former past president of MSA and current board member of MSA. Um, Isaac is also on the board of Sculpture Fields in Chattanooga. Isaac has many accomplishments as a practicing artist, um, has his own uh, studio in Chattanooga um, where he builds and designs his own sculptures along with helping install many other uh, sculptures for noteworthy, noted um, sculptors such as John Henry, Shakaya Booker, and many others. Thank you, Jason. And thank you everybody for tuning in today. Uh, this is gonna be a special and great uh, panel discussion. I'm honored to be here with this special group of brothers and sisters in the arts. I see them as such uh, because we share a common goal as creators, visionaries, bearers of truth, and last but not least, as fellow human beings that use their time bringing people together to remind them of their humanity by using the arts. Today, we have five panelists. Our first panelist that I'd like to introduce is Phoenix Savage. Phoenix Savage was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship in 2011. Savage spent nearly a year in Nigeria conducting research that is continually unfolding in her works, such as Iyepe, Vine, Vidi, Vice. The birds are all here. I came, I saw, I conquered an owl, mystery, or Joy's Ogede, Joy's banana. Savage's research in Nigeria dealt with both the Yoruba philo philosophical concept of Ori, head, and investigations of metal casting in the city Ile Ife. Savage also taught at Obafe Obafeme Awolowo, University during her time in Nigeria. Savage is the 2022 recipient of the Revolution Artist in Residency with the Santa Fe Art Institute. In 2019, Savage was awarded Teacher of the Year by the Mississippi Humanities Council. She teaches at Tugalo College, a historically black college where she directs the visual art and social practice program in the mass communications department. Savage received her MFA in sculpture at Georgia State University in 2011. She also holds two additional graduate level degrees. The first in medical anthropology from the University of Mississippi in, 21, in 2001, and the second in studio arts at Northwestern State University in 2008. Savage is a graduate of Mississippi Valley State University in 1998, as well as having graduated with a degree in advertising design from the Art Institute of Philadelphia in 1984. The next panelist is Brian Massey. Brian Winfred, Winfred Massey, senior, is currently the chair of the Department of Art and Design and a professor of art, sculpture, design at the University of Central Arkansas, Conway. He received a Bachelor's of Fine Arts from East Carolina State, uh, East Carolina University in Greenville, North Carolina. His Master's of Fine Arts from Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He is currently working to finish his Doctorate of Education at the University of Arkansas, Little Rock in Higher Education Administration. He is primarily a stone carver who works with a variation of stones from alabaster, soapstone, limestone, marble, and granite. He also casts in iron, bronze, and aluminum, as well as create fabrications of large scale sculptures in steel. Some of his completed works include the Sidney S. McMath Memorial in Little Rock, the Silas Herbert Hunt Memorial in Fayetteville, Arkansas, tribute to Stradivarius at the Grammy Museum in Cleveland, um, Mississippi, and no stress, no pressure in the sculpture garden at the new Cardi Center, uh, Cancer Center in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, 
Also, you can see some of his works um, on the campus of the University of Arkansas. He has a, uh, a 15 foot piece, uh, bear, stainless steel bear named Otis. And Wong and Win Song won at the Fort Smith Riverfront Sculpture Walk Park. Our next pan panelist is Miranda Kyle. Miranda is a program manager of arts and culture for Atlanta Beltline, ABI, and curates the annual art on the Atlanta Beltline public art exhibition. After an academic fellowship at ABI and assisting with installations in subsequent years, Kyle was appointed to her current position in 2017. Since then, she has reconstructed ABI's public art program, managed an NEA, our town grant, uh, to create and implement an arts and culture strategic implementation plan and overseeing the commissioning of hundreds of art acti activations along the corridor. Kyle's works on inter in interdepartmental collaborations with uh, community engagements and planning by managing relationships with outside art organizations and institutions such as the National Black Arts Festival, the Woodruff Center for the Arts, Living Walls, Southern Fried Queer Pride, and Art Atlanta Gallery. Kyle holds an MFA in sculpture from Savannah College of Art and Design and an MA in painting and drawing from the Edinburgh College of Art. She was awarded in 2013 the Lee Kimchi McGrath Fellowship for Arts and Science for her research in utilizing 3D printing technologies within traditional foundry practices. And in 2014, she was awarded the Starseed Fellowship to research the, the intersection of public art, performance, and space in Riga and Pevlia, uh, Latvia. Our next artist is Preston Jackson. Preston is Professor Emeritus at the Schoolyard Institute of Chicago. He was recently awarded a regional Emmy for hosting Legacy in Bronze, a television show featuring his Julianne's Garden Sculptures, and was named in 1998 Laureates of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois. In 2018, he was chosen as number six of the top 10 Illinois artists and architects of all time, the first living person on the list. Preston creates bronze figurative works, monumental bronze and steel sculptures, as well as two-dimensional work. Preston's work centers on where we have been and where we are going, both in a historical and a philosophical sense. His works include bronze facades and doors for the Chahokaya Mound, Museum, a bronze uh, sculpture of Irv Kassetnet for the city of Chicago, a larger than life-size sculpture of comedian Richard Pryor in Peoria, Peoria a life-size figure of Miles Davis in Alton, Illinois, monumental stainless steel and bronze sculptures for McCormick Place West in Chicago, Purdue University, Urbana, Illinois, uh, the Tra Chicago Transit Authority in Peoria, and many more. A cast bronze monument m memorializing the 1908 Springfield, Illinois race riot. A bronze cast and granite monument for Decatur, Illinois. A Martin Luther King Memorial bust for Danville, Illinois, and many more. Our last but not least artist and panelist is Xaveria Simmons. Xaveria Simmons' sweeping body of work includes photography, performance, choreography, video sound, sculpture, and installations. Simmons received her BFA from Brad College in 2004 after spending two years on a walking pilgrimage, retracing the transatlantic slave trade with Buddhist monks. She uh, completed the Whitney Museum's independent study program in studio art in 2005 while simultaneously completing a two-year actor training conservatory with the Maggie Flanagan Studio in New York. 
Simmons' works are in major museums and private collections, including the Museum of Modern Art, New York, Deutsche Bank, New York, UBS, New York, the Guggenheim Museum, the Agnes Gunn Art Collection, the Museum of Contemporary Art of Chicago, the Studio Museum of Harlem, ICA Miami, Perez Art Museum, the Witherspoon Museum, the Nasher uh, Museum, the High Museum. Um, she, she was a visiting lecturer and a Solomon Fellow at Harvard University in 2020 and has been awarded the Charles Flint Kellogg Award in Arts and Letters from Bard College this summer. This fall and winter 2021, Simmons will have works on view at Socrates Sculpture Park in New York, Times Square, New York, Columbia University, and the Moody Gallery at Rice University, among many other exhibitions. These are our panelists today, and I'm so happy and proud to be a part of this discussion. So thank you once again. The way that I would like to go around this uh, topic is first, I would like everybody to know that uh, with dealing with this topic, I would like to frame the discussion around the artists and the artist's view. Uh, there's a lot of uh, videos and discussions on this because it's very important that we talk about it. And one of the things I see is that um, it's, we have a lot of um, historians, a lot of planners. And what makes this one I, I feel that special is that we have a group of artists that practice in making the pieces and putting them out from conception to installation. So let's start this discussion, uh, panelists, on tearing down the monu monument with a quick understanding of the purpose of monuments and uh, memorials. I, I took this information from an organization called Facing History and Ourselves, and it had a really good um, definition that, that I'm going to use. Monuments and memorials serve multiple functions in the communities in which they are erected. When the members of the community create a monument or memorial, they are making sure and to make, they are making a statement about the idea, values, or individuals they think their society should remember, if not honor. As a result, these structures not only influence the way people understand the subject of their uh, commemoration, but they also reveal the beliefs of the people and the time period in which they are created. They thus serve as historical artifacts in themselves. What's interesting is that in examining, in examining this statement, we also understand what the, right, what's not written, but is often proven true. That which a culture mem memorializes speaks of what they choose to forget as much as they choose to remember. So my first volley of questions, panelists, this. What are monuments to you? What do they do? Does memorializing play in your work of art or planning? And if you create or place monuments, what do you try to achieve for its audience? And we can go with anybody who's interested in talking about it first. Well, I'll start it off as, the, um, you know, to, for me to do a, a memorial for a particular subject matter is about storytelling, uh, about positive storytelling. Uh, a good example, of, a lot of people did, don't know that Silas Herbert Hunt was a World War II veteran that fought in the Battle of the Bulge and the first African-American to ever be enrolled at the University of Arkansas Law School in 1948. And when I did that memorial doing the research, uh, it was a good positive story for me to tell about, you know, because uh, I wasn't aware of it until I did the research and learned the story behind that, that memorial. Uh, he, never, he didn't finish the, the degree because he contracted tuberculosis from wounds he suffered at Battle of the Bulge and ended up dying from those wounds as well from the, uh, from the sickness. But um, university back in 2008 
uh, posthumously awarded him his law degree to his surviving family members. But that memorial for me tells a positive story of, of, of a, a, a person of color that's not in the history books. That's what memorial means for me when I do an installation in that type of setting to tell a positive story, let people know that you know there's more to your American history than what you're reading on actual pages in black and white. I'll go next. Um, thank you, Brian, and thanks everyone for having me and being here. Um, I'll just quickly say that I, <laughs> The monuments that I'm interested in making are ones that explain to the, the United States that the debt is owed. It's a massive debt. I am a descendant of slavery on all sides of my lineage. <laughs> my ancestors have been here for a really long time that I know of. And uh, the monuments that I have up now in New York are all um, about uh, Special Order 15, which is, uh, you know, basically the basis of 40 acres and a mule and um, a monument toward it's it's a huge monument towards reparations and it's text based and it's I'm really interested in the United States paying its bills to us as um, descendants of slavery and I'm also in, interested in the 70% majority population of white people not saying they need to learn <laughs> actually but just taking it in and um, understanding that there's a debt to be paid. So my monuments are not really memorials. They're more um, towards a future. I'm very much interested in abolition as it relates to the contemporary time. And so um, all of my monuments are gonna push towards that. I'm, I'm not yet, I'm, I haven't really memorialized anything. So that's where I am right now. And those are the works um, that are on view right now uh, in New York City. So um, that's my brief answer. Well, I'll, I'll go next. Um, let's see. Oh, can I see me? Yeah, OK. I, um, I, I'm, I'm old. Older than you guys, see that? Uh, <laughs> and my memory goes way back, and um, more than you know, childish things or important things like school. I I try to focus on what I felt and how I responded to things that happened in the, in the past that um, formed our opinions and things that would that has physically and psychologically. Uh, affected me. I've always been a rebellious person, uh, not physically or crazy out there, but I knew that I had certain powers when I became an artist because it caught the attention of people in the family first. You know, in fact, that was my testing ground, how my brothers and sisters responded to things. I mean, my siblings how they responded to the things that I produced. Uh, I always knew I was a thing maker, a maker of objects. Uh, there was always a challenge to figure it out, you know. But one thing that I was quite aware of was the fact that there were no African American people on early television, even as far back as radio, and especially the movies. And it's like, I'm always asking myself, well, where are they? Who are they? Because uh, you never see us, you know? And, and all throughout my childhood, you know, I ask this question. So my way of doing something about it or creating images that were fantasy or images that were copies or influenced by real people, um, I began to speak through my art making. I play jazz, I'm a jazz musician, and I also own this building that I'm in. <laughs> this is Contemporary Art Center. I don't know whether you can see this or not. Yes. It's a very large building purchased from, um, you know, uh, a commission that I got. And so I put all the money in this building. 
so that I can further educate and also um, uh, allow myself to speak in a louder or, or, or a larger a larger audience. So um, I believe in diversity. I do not believe in racism or that nasty stuff, you know. Uh, you guys, you know, a lot of you have visited some of the places that you're speaking about. I mean, Chattanooga, you know, Vicksburg, Tougaloo, you know, Fisk. I mean, these are names that make me do something inside uncontrollably. <laughs> uncontrollably. But these are words and names and places that bring emotion to me, you know. And I guess it's my task, I always felt, was to materialize these emotions, materialize these thoughts, these sounds. And, you know, hanging out with John Dow and Richard Hunt and uh, you know, Isaac, I know you know these guys, but hanging out with people like that, we spoke through our, what did we speak? We spoke through imagery that was in our heads. It was a part of the sound of speech or speech itself, you know. Um, Anyway, so I, I, I just got out there and I, I made it happen. I made it happen, hopefully uh, affect many, many people. So I'm, I'm into this diversity thing. You know, at the Art Institute, uh, I spent, what, 20, 25 years there, you know. Uh, the main purpose uh, or the main thing that I was involved with was the idea of diversity because it definitely was not there, okay. Uh, I mean, a beautiful place to work, beautiful friends, and good things happen, especially with my students. I think I, were, I was closer uh, to my students or with my students than anything else because it wasn't, you know, the faculty or staff or other people. But um, I taught Tai Chi Chuan, you know, I had studied with Master Su Kim, you know, in Seoul, Korea. I learned the martial arts and um, I had a martial arts school and also uh, play jazz. But the thing about it is that I always felt that all of these things linked together. There was no working on one specific thing because all of the elements were so sim simple. Right. So my task was how to, um, how to communicate, how to bring expression or words or to pass something to someone else. And, in, and uh, that's healing, healing or, or are making this a better place, you know, where, where we are. So exactly. So with 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 that, it's it's important for us to remember that memorials are there; they're created by people. But we, as artists, are the ones that also get a chance to dictate the new memorials to come out, the new right. memories right. to put, and it's up to us to get ahead and take those steps forward and to invest in ourselves so we can also open the doors to invest in other people. Exactly. Phoenix, Phoenix were you going to say something? Uh, well, I, um, I'm glad you mentioned that all of this uh, talking that you just heard that, that came from my mouth is to let you know it is about memorials. This building is a memorial. All right. uh, um, you know, the paintings, the movement, the art of movement, you know, my whole body, my whole existence, it is, a memorial. Memorials are necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely necessary. It's just that in my childhood, I never saw many memorials or uh, presentations or uh, movies or anything that spoke of my culture. Right. And, right. You know, we were there. <laughs> right. Thank you, Preston. Phoenix? Um, no, just that I know there's a specificity to the conversation about memorials and monuments, but I guess in working on a new public art piece um, right now, just trying to win my first public art piece, um, I'm thinking more about how you create something that goes out to the public that allows any person to locate themselves, not that it becomes something so specified that um, becomes an exclusion the way 
the issue is currently with the monuments that people want to to take down. So I'm just sort of looking at how we as people, how any person sort of locates themselves, you know, sort of like the bean in Chicago. This is nebulous bean, it's not really a bean, but people call it the bean. Um, but, but each person in their own right, because they can stand there and take a selfie and see themselves, has this ability to locate themselves within that sculpture. And it be, it's divorced of a certain level of, I don't know, controversy. And so I'm, I'm looking at, 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 at that in terms of um, public works. And how about you, Miranda, with uh, placement and curata uh, curating? I just say, as a curator, I have a, an interesting perspective. You know, I manage one of the biggest public art programs in the American South. And as a person who, on one side of my family uh, is deeply indigenous and on the other side of my family are colonizers, you know, I have a very complicated relationship with place. And so when we talk about spaces and the occupancy of spaces and ownership of spaces, you know, there is always a voice in my head that is saying indigenous sovereignty and land back and who has the right to this space. So because of that, I believe there is a toxicity in this idea of permanence and a thing belongs in the space forever and that we should wholly embrace public space as a dialogue between people who have been and people who are engaging in this space. And we need to let go of this idea that a thing belongs here forever and that we need to enter into conversations in space with this idea of the ephemeral and that as we build community together in these spaces, it's a, a palimpsest, you know, we're building on top of these narratives. And that allows us to let go of toxic concepts of ownership and who has the right to claim this space. Um, because historically it's been whoever is in power, whoever holds the purse springs gets, you know, gets to dictate what lives in a space. And so I'm excited about this idea in, in new dialogues around how we curate space together and in conversation together and the power of a destroyed monument and its remnants and what that says about the struggle of the process to remove that piece and how those remnants are just as important as anything new we may create to elicit a better community for ourselves in that shared space. So that's where I am when I approach these works and the images that we looked at earlier are all of community actions onto public space. You know, when we were looking at the pieces when my name came up earlier, these are a combination of things I had no control of, but that happened in the spaces that I curate and why it's so important to allow what many commissioning bodies would call vandalism or graffiti or community action to be a part of that public art dialogue and to not ignore that community haptic response to a thing occupying space. That's a, uh, that's a great segue uh, to something I was going to bring up. You know, Can I talking... just jump in one, oh, yes. one minute? I just Please. want to point out, just going, going off of what Miranda is saying, and is that, you know, the United States itself, the physical, beyond being like, in, it's indigenous to the core, you know, but it's also a monument to an ideology. And I think that we have to remember that, like, our physical works are one layer, but actually the United States, not the, the landscape Turtle Island that was in, the indigenous a, you know, territory, but the construction of the United States is a monument that's, a, that's tied to Great Britain, that's tied to white supremacy, that's tied to a doctrine of discovery, that's tied to, you know, a monument of, of, of empire. And I think, the, I think Americans forget that we are connected to Europe and Europe's desires for conquest. And so the United States is a monument to Europe, really, when you really start to break it down. And so it's difficult to unravel such a thing because it is tied to might on another side of the ocean. So I just want to put that out there beyond like our artworks that the space itself is a monument 
So that's why I think it's difficult for us to conceptualize a way out of what we're dealing with because we're dealing with a monument to whiteness, basically, and Europeanness, basically. Right. Now, yes. What's, <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's, what's interesting is that you know today we um, we have a lot of monuments that are being torn down uh, by people or removed removed uh, all around the world. And it's just amazing to look on the news. I mean, you have the Confederate um, General Robert E. Lee in Montgomery that came down. You have at the Minnesota Capitol in St. Paul, you have members of the uh, American Indian Movement uh, take down the bronze uh, statue of um, Christopher Columbus. Mm -hmm. You have in Bristol, um, you have the 17th century British slave trader, uh, Edward Coulson, that was pulled down and then thrown into the harbor. Um, you have the Misak indigenous people of Papaya in Colombia knocked down a statue of Sebastian de la Bella a la Casa last, last, practically like last week or it was like two weeks ago. And then in New York, you know, where we don't really think about all these monuments that, are, that, are, that create trauma, you have uh, J. Marion Sims, who's a father of uh, modern gynecology, but also he performed his painful surgeries you know, on enslaved black women without anesthesia. So it's interesting to see that we are at a time that, that with all um, the information, technology at our fingertips, that the masses are really saying it is time to reevaluate ourselves. It's time mm -hmm. for us to really look in, look in the mirror and really see who we are, what we do, and how everything lines up as a nation. Um, so take, keeping that in consideration, you know, there's over 1,747 Confederate monuments, places, and other symbols in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. There's over 780 that are actual monuments. There's uh, more than 300 which are in the states of Georgia, Virginia, and North Carolina. So, and what people don't understand, and it's a constant battle in explaining that these weren't pieces that were put up during the Civil War. They were put up after the Civil War. And there were two time periods that it spiked. Okay. Mm -hmm. One was in the 1900s when the Southern states were enacting Jim Crow and um, they wanted to disenfranchise African Americans and resegregate the society. Uh, in years after uh, recon, uh, recon, reconstruction, okay? And that lasted up until the 20s. Then the next spike was after, uh, during the mid 50s and the 60s during this modern civil rights movement, okay? And it's, it's interesting that their conversation keeps going back to a question of erasure. So my question to you, how is tearing down and removing monuments a part of the intentional repositioning of our national memory? And how do you respond to arguments uh, that monuments are situated in a particular historical time and that to tear them down is an act of erasure? Whoever wishes to go first on that one. Uh, I don't know how it is, uh, um, Isaac. You know, you look at uh, you, you talk about Europe. When, when when Germany lost World War II, there's nothing in this present state that, that indicates that Nazism and Hitler were heroes. The South lost the Civil War, but yet we have all these monuments to commemorate things that they lost. And they talk about you're, you're erasing our history, you're, you're erasing our heritage, but they, they forget about they came over in this country, and all the memorials that the indigenous Native Americans had up for them, their, their lost loved ones, they just went and just took the land, destroyed that property, and there's no history or record that ever indicated that this was a sacred memorial ground for our ancestors of Native Americans. You know, coming from both sides of the issue, ancestry from Africa, uh, Cherokee in my blood, 
So I'm getting it from both sides. So it's hard for me to really understand the argument. Well, we want to keep our heritage, but yet they forget about what they've already destroyed beforehand and put those monuments so. up. I mean, just really simply, you know, hatred and racism does not deserve to be memorialized in bronze and stone. It can live in a history book where people can learn about it there, just as Brian stated, you know, that Nazi Germany is not lauded as, you know, a, a period in Germany's history, but every child who goes to school knows what happened, you know, but just like the Daughters of the Confederacy commissioned all these Confederate memorials, they also dictated curriculum for school books that were still used in the South up until 1978 before that. So it wasn't just monuments, it was also education. And so when that level of manipulation happens, that's where that perversion of narrative happens, where it is, this is our heritage, these have always been here, instead of the truth that y'all put in stone and bronze, not just racism, but traitors to the country that you live in. And you're saying that that's okay. And it just, it isn't, you know, these, these men from that period in history can live in a history book and that's where they belong. They don't belong in bronze. You know, I'd like to, um, my, my beef with this entire thing is the fact that these atrocities took place throughout each generation, right before our eyes. And in a, in, a, in a very strange way, the proof of these things or this action or these attitudes exists everywhere. I mean, Native Americans have left trails for us along the river, Illinois River, that I ride my bike on. The highway systems that we see, that we travel, you know, from Cairo, Illinois to Chicago, trails of people that are treated the way they are today, you know, or have always been. Um, not just in buildings, uh, but, but we, we, we see it, we, we live it. Uh, designs, you know, such as African buildings that still exist but who gets credit for it. Uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's so much proof here that we deserve some recognition of some times and I mean, you know, some kind and some form of reparations. But the most evil thing is that we have died. We have given up our lives for the fact that we know that something greater and much larger has happened here and it was created by people you know, of color from other places or people that were enslaved. So I think in, if you remove the monuments, which I'm not saying that, <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I do not support what the monuments glorify. I do not support the hegemony that the monuments purport. But I don't actually support removing the monument either, <laughs> which it's a hard sell. But if you remove the monument, I'm not sure what that gets us in the scheme of dismantling white hegemony. So you remove this thing from public view, um, this process of, of public history. If you kept this thing in public history, just like if you wanted to keep it in the history book, you would want to keep it in the public, public history as well and recontextualize what it is not to just dismantle it. I don't necessarily think dismantling anything other than, you know, if there's a way to dismantle complete racism in America, which I'm, I'm dubious as to whether that's really possible. Um, I don't, I just don't, I just think that there's a way to recontextualize and a way to put up adjacent monuments that give you the fuller story. I would rather, a child or a person walk up to a series of monuments or a series of public pieces and be able to extrapolate the, the truth from that as opposed to just the one false monument of the guy on the horse who, 
you know, save the day, save the world or whatever. The other thing about the, the monuments is I also think about the, the people who possibly actually made the monuments. I know the monuments are glorifying a, a particular lie and a particular mythological presence of, of whiteness, but the people who actually made those monuments, who worked in those foundries, I think there is something to be honored for them in their labor, particularly when you look at what went into making such a monument back then. There is, to me, something to be valued by that. And I see it as a work of art more than I see it as this thing that's trying me believing in a certain, you know, a level of of supremacy or ideology. It, it, they, they are works of art and they are actually quite beautiful. So dismantling them and doing what with the material or leaving a blank um, podium <laughs> in, in just, you know, empty air, I don't, I don't see where that helps us. I don't see where that gets me any further. I don't see where it, it saves the potentiality of a black or brown person when they come in contact with a police officer further down the road. But so it doesn't, it's, it's to me, it's like low hanging fruit. And it's maybe a victory to someone who takes the monument down. But overall, there, there's no victory. I don't, I don't see where it, I, I, I get a victory from that as a, 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 a black woman. And so I would rather recontextualize the monuments, put adjacent monuments, have a different narrative and, 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 and keep it moving as opposed to this erasure of, of, of it, but not erasure in this way that other people are saying it. They are really saying, you know, don't remove the thing that's holding up white hegemony. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying don't remove the thing that is telling something and adjacent to it, there's something else being told. And together it's telling a fuller picture and is it, we're able to make make understandings that, that don't currently exist right now. I think the Robert E. Lee, just going off of what you're saying, Phoenix, the Robert E. Lee monument that is slated to be torn down in um, Richmond, Virginia, is, is a, an amazing example of the monument is, you know, everything that happened in Richmond over the past few months, six months, you know, the monument is totally, <laughs> looks totally different. I've been going to Richmond for years. Um, and so I've seen it and, and, you know, I went to see it. I went specifically to see the monument in its current state, which is like, you know, if you Google it, it's like a total, you know, it's the monument man is still on top. He's still on top. And then the, 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 the foundation of it is all graffitied and, and tagged. And then what you don't see in the press is that the community is like watching over. So you have like, um, there's a garden on to the left. <laughs> there's like a basketball court happening. There's like tourists coming in. You have like all of this graffiti with black lives. You have memorials for like all these people. You have people on the sides watching. You have entertainers over here and that's what's going on and that's a major circle in a very affluent neighborhood and so i think i mean i think there's i think there's something to both sides like i agree with you phoenix i, I feel like in that moment like i don't want that monument to go in a way because it just is doing the damn thing right so cities would have to let that happen you know what i mean that impulse happen like across the board. So you can keep your monument, but we get to have a say in what your monument is doing right now. And again, and I agree with you, Phoenix, at the end of the day, it's still not enough. Like you could take down all the monuments you want, but until you take down the narrative that A, this, this land is ours to, to, to own and B, like you don't owe uh, descendants of slavery in the United States about like, 17 trillion dollars at because of the labor of our ancestors who built this place then you know what i mean like and then you also don't take down the idea of whiteness as something that should be treasured as a as a oppressive entity then i mean yeah then we just stay the same monuments no monuments yeah it doesn't change much and i think that that absolutely speaks to trying to get bureaucracies and cities and counties and commissioning bodies to embrace that haptic in place dialogue, right? 
because you can't you can't put a box around a Columbus statue and not expect people to graffiti all over it. And then you can't also have like the Robert E. Lee statue in Richmond that you were just talking about, um, you know, tearing it down now does more damage than allowing that action against that monument and what it originally stood for to stand, right? Like I much would rather see a continued dialogue on top of a piece than either more commissionings of, uh, you know, additional, 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 or complete removal, right? Like the rubble, the remnant, the dialogue has to be part of that, the space and the intention of that piece has to be allowed to without, you know, the commissioning agency or the city or whoever stepping in and cleaning it or fixing it or tearing it down or whatever. So I think there is a really great middle ground there that removes the alt-right worship of these traitorous generals um, and allows the people to respond to that thing occupying their space. Which, which is so interesting that you use that example because it, there, there has been like an appropriation of that piece. That piece is no longer in a sense, when you look at it today, you just go look at it. It doesn't remind you or you don't think about the purpose that it was. Now it has the purpose, purpose that it is, right? Because we have everybody that has flocked to it and put their hands on it and given it more of a contemporary meaning and a life to it. But what's interesting is that how how is that going to continue or will it continue when you have um, new policies laws and regulations that are that are being brought forth um, such as the executive order of protecting american monuments memorials and statues and com um, combating recent uh, criminal violence that the president recently did where it makes it illegal to destroy damage vandalize um, desecrate a monument, memorial, or a statue uh, within the United States. It persecutes to the fullest extreme those that are caught um, damaging, defacing, destroying uh, religious property and artworks. It also withholds uh, federal support from state and local law enforcement uh, for not protecting these monuments. So if we do keep these, hoping that there will be an ongoing conversation and more appropriation is it not also giving or leave, creating a instance where we're also setting up people to actually fall into a, a trap and then be, be persecuted by the government for reappropriating and recontextualizing these, these uh, monuments that are there? So I think that's a really, I'm sorry. It's a really great question and the whole issue of the trap there is nothing in America that is not a trap. Every single legislation, every single thing is a trap. And the thing is to, to figure out a level of awareness um, so that you can you know, know where to step, basically. Um, so yeah, but the, the, if we keep with the, the, the example of um, Richmond, that community has reclaimed that space and reclaimed that monument and reclaimed its meaning in relationship to themselves. So one can only hope, I don't like the word hope, but one can only trust that maybe someone in that community is helping to organize around that so that they can take their reclamation one step further so that in the event of such a law, they can figure out how to combat that or figure out some roadblock so that they don't fall into that trap. But yeah, without further dialogue and without further information and organizing, yeah, it's 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 a trap. But they're all traps. There, there's there's a there's there's always a speed trap out there waiting for one of us at any given time in in this society. And I think Ling, but I think even you even you bringing it up in this way. Um, Isaac actually concretizes it more. So I don't want to ignore, I don't want to say to ignore these things, but at the same time, I think that we have to recognize 
there are that we are in a very like different space because of COVID and because of the revolution that's happening in the streets and because of our awareness through this social media. You know, there's a few things happening that are allowing us to see things a little bit clearer. And I don't know how long this window is gonna be, probably a little while. So I think that we have to recognize that we young folks are on the streets, they're in the ground, they're on, they are doing it. And then there's also elders on the streets doing the thing. There's a lot of people doing the work and if we keep legitimizing this language, it will just keep coming on us. And I don't agree. I think that that language can totally come and so can the counter force. There's cause and effect to all of this. And we just have to remain active, not only as artists, but as citizens. That's the, that's the beauty of what's been going on is that people have been emboldened to be active citizens. What for, crazy and for also for a shift, which is what we're living through. We're living through a shift. And I think we're, we're not used to living through a shift. So it's hard for us to accept that this shift is still happening. So we have to embrace the shift part, which is why I talk a lot about, I use the language of abolition and try to look to those, to the, the women, the black women who have embodied that language for a long time because they understand that newness has to keep happening and that act, and, and going back to what Phoenix is saying, the organizing has to keep occurring. I guess yeah, I appreciate everything that's going forward and it's going forward. I, I wanna go back to what uh, Phoenix said a little earlier about, you know, whether the monuments are there or whether the monuments are not there, uh, doesn't really change a lot of things. Uh, for me, it's, 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 it's you know, we can we can have conversation, we can talk about these things, but you know, no nobody is born a racist. Nobody is born, they don't born in their prejudice. It's it's all taught and learned behavior. And the thing about that for me is with the monuments there or not, if I can have communication with um, those good old boys and, 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 and deal with the heart issue. I think we can change a lot of things that way. You know, nobody really talks about the, the, the spiritual side of these things. They talk about the physical side of things. But I think, you know, you have to look at the spiritual side of things and if we get the, the changing of people's hearts towards these things, I think we can come to a more better feeling of conversation about what's going on in this country. Those good old boys love their good old guns is, and they love that second amendment. That's the I live, I live two, up, two hours upstate of New York City. It basically could be any Alabama. It could be anywhere. It's the same. The whole United States is the same. It's the same, except for maybe a little bit parts of the cities. It's the same. I have the good old boys two hours away from New York. The sheriff has never been to New York City. It's the gun. At the end of the day, all of what we do, at the end of the day, those guns are real. And no heart conversation is going to open up those guns. I don't know. That's a mystical thing that we have yet to transform. But I want to know, maybe someone understands that. How I mean, as, as a kid who grew up in the South, and now I live in Atlanta, we do not pronounce the second T, by the way, and I grew up hunting. I have a shotgun and a handgun in my bedroom right now, you know, there, that conversation about firearms is generally with most of the people I knew and grew up hunting with and everything else. It's this misconstrued idea of you're telling me I, this way of life that I have known of hunting, going shooting with my buddies, shooting skeet, you know, that someone wants to tell me I can't live this way anymore. So touching on what Brian said about the heart of the conversation is that comparison with Joe Bob, how you feel about somebody telling you that you can't go out and go deer hunting, you know, in November when you've been waiting on the rut every year and someone's going to come and take your guns is exactly how these groups of folks feel about X, Y, and Z. And that's that hard conversation of being like in that same way that you're feeling like your life is being asked to change this group of folks has also felt like they've always lived in a state of being asked to change. 
And when we talk about these public spaces that everybody is saying commemorates their way to live, it is reaching a collaboration where we're talking about how capitalism has forced all of us into this conversation of, no, you've got to protect this like, you know, square block you live on and your way of life is the only way you've known. And it teaches us to not compromise and come to a middle ground of sharing these spaces together and finding that like common ground. And that sounds like very fluffy and like, oh, we've got to find common ground. And especially in a world where, and the debates last night are a perfect example where like, it doesn't feel like we'll ever find common ground again. Um, but that internalized capitalism that we all have when we start pulling that apart, we can start finding mutual community in us working together for how we can come to some sort of agreement on our shared space. Right. And, you know, one of the things that I find, you know, I'm originally from New York and I've been down here in the South for about 20 years. And I have some friends that are good old boys. And I've had them take me out to the range and show me how to shoot a gun and, and that I never could do in New York City. You know, I've, they've showed me how to do different things with, you know, vegetables. Right. And it's, it comes, it does come down to, and I think this is the biggest problem that we have as a society that we've pretty much lost and the will to sit down and have the conversations and make a true effort on making relationships. A lot want to say, I have this, I know this, and this is all I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then others say, well, you do that, go ahead and I'm done with you. So, but there has to be a little bit more. Uh, we talked about earlier with Daughters of the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. Daughters of Confederacy, their literature was out in the South up until the 70s. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of decades and not a lot of decades of, uh, to get rid of a lot of brainwashing, okay? So when we look at conversations and dealing with people, sometimes we have to figure out where they're at. Some will not change period. Those you can't do anything with. But there are those who, who will and can, as long as there's somebody to get ahead and, and try to help them understand and relate of A is this for me, A is that for you. And we have to see that, you know, if you feel bad when this happens, I feel bad when this happens. If you don't do that, I won't do this because we both understand what pain is. So, but that gets off into a different subject. Did somebody want to make an extra comment or should, can I get back to another monument type of question? Well, I want to say something um, again. Yeah, I, cause this conversation, it is about monuments. Uh, I don't know, uh, I, I, you know, I try to generalize the thing, but you know, I want you to know that everything we do is monumental in a way, especially when it affects certain groups of people. Um, I, I, you know, like, like you had mentioned, uh, Phoenix, I had that same feeling as a figurative artist getting commissioned to build something. I asked myself, or, or to build a statue of someone, I, I asked myself if I was faced with having to answer the question to tear this down immediately. I mean, there's a lot of them in this country. I mean, there's thousands of them. Uh, and as an artist myself, I went to Vicksburg and I looked at these really huge and, and wonderfully made statues. And I'm saying, should we tear it down? Because I'm thinking of the artists also, and, and not just the artists, but uh, all of the work involved in it, maybe. So I, I'm, I'm, con I'm confronted with this. And the fact that we don't have the answers, I think we all seem to agree immediately. I, I understand, uh, uh, Miranda, you know, about freedom and choice and, you know, that, that should be, and I agree uh, to some degree. Um, but somehow, I don't want to wait. Uh, back in the movement, you know, civil rights movement, we were always told, Things will get better, you know, things will get better. Just wait a little bit. Well, we didn't agree with that. 
And this is why, you know, the Black Panthers came. We, we just didn't agree uh, with waiting because people are dying when you wait. I mean, uh, the policemen are shooting black men every day, young black kids every day. And we're waiting to solve this problem. And, and then we got another leader that doesn't speak out against violence. So we're waiting again to make a decision whether to tear them down. Well, I don't say tear them down uh, all of a sudden, but maybe we should destroy the educational process uh, um, immediately. This is something that we can do physically and immediate. We can change people. We can teach them to love and to get along. We can teach them the history of the people, probably a lot of black people that help build these things. We need to teach. So, so that's, that's where I am. But that brings up the question about um, complicity. Uh, artists and those who, as, as artists, sometimes we get all these offered, offers for um, the use of our talent, for our labor, all right? So my question is, what is the artist's responsibility um, when it comes to creating memorials and monuments? You know, and especially in some of these cases where, you know, you might get something that you might not really agree with. Is it the artist's responsibility to themselves to get and continue to make a living? Uh, to uh, take, the, take the commission and deal with the client? Is it, are they responsible to society that they live in or the future? You know, how that piece is going to affect the future. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, before I accept a commission, you know, in my own personal feelings and thinking, I am very curious as to who my audience is. I, I want to, to know where this will be placed and what good will it do. A lot of young artists, younger artists, are motivated by the fact they need to eat. <laughs> they need to, to make a living, you know, and maybe, just maybe, they'll be able to express their true feelings about race relationships after uh, they have a full stomach. So it's, it's a very difficult uh, uh, si situation. I personally, you know, when I see for the first time a Confederate statue uh, or statues, period, especially the movie industry, look, let's look at the other arts, let's look at cinema, and you see the roles that people that look like you have to play in order to make a living. There's an anger right there. Whether I starve or not, you know, that, that, that's not important. My first response is to get it out of my face. Don't be involved with it. Don't allow it to exist but it, because it only furthers, you know, uh, this um, problem that, that has been bestowed, bestowed upon us, you know, psychological feelings. I mean, our entire life is formed by race. Zaveria, were you going to say something? I can let someone else speak. Well, I, I, I was going to say two things. One, and don't take this the wrong way, it's just art. I just don't, it's not, it's not brain surgery. It's not, I love my art. I love art. It's important to me, but it is art. It is art. I do not like the idea that somehow as artists, we have to assume a role of, of fixing the ills of the world with our art. It's art. It's, it's, it's not heart surgery. It's not brain surgery. It's not curing or killing anyone. So I don't personally take on a responsibility to create some body of work that is going to save humanity. It's, it's not, it, that's just not, in my studio practice, that's not what I do. As a teacher, that's what I do. I exercise that in my teaching of, of spending time with students, getting them to understand their, 
their, their themselves in in the universe. But in art, that's that's not a goal that I that I have, and I don't want to place that burden on myself or my art to serve that role for 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 anybody. So I just I just want to clear that up. I'm I'm not <laughs> doing that. It's I'm interesting. Like the, oh. oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, dear. I'll just be. I'm kind of like the opposite. In a, I'm opposite end. I mean, I always allow myself a pause in my work so even in my with the monuments that i have up right now there's two that are heavy hitting politically engaged and there's one that is strictly about you know the materials and the labor and the beauty of the object but for me having you know i i i understand that i'm complicit in all of it because I, you know i live in the united states if i teach like when i taught at harvard i taught my students about the institution itself, I told them like this is a, this this place is unacceptable as an institution, and you should be working to undo it. When I I understand the monies that I when I receive monies, you know, I also I have relationships with with collectors, with philanthropists, with you know institution, all these things, and I speak to them the same way that I speak to the you know my friends to you. Like I don't pull my tongue in terms of like trying to get them to let me know where the resources are coming from. I understand that we're all complicit at the end of the day because the money, you know, no money is clean. There's no clean money, you know, but I also, I want to be conscious of that. And at the same time, I also allow myself to like make really beautiful images of flowers or like, you know, I give a pause, like I give breath to myself. And then I also, I, I'm interested in this, the United States shifting. Like I am, I am wholeheartedly interested and that has to be a part of, for me, a part of my labor because I, I understand the impacts of slavery on my family and then on my community to the degree I was seeing this country and seeing what it has done to the community that I'm from is, is too devastating for me not to question at all times where these resources are and how to radically redistribute and demand a radical redistribution and it comes through my work and at the same time I will take my time and also enjoy and and have pleasure and beauty and sensuality and all those other things it's it's both for me with my work I, and as a curator it is there is no I have no flexibility to not be accountable to the community so especially as a public art curator, there is no liminality in experience when it comes to public art. There is no breath or space for the lay person or the pedestrian or the cyclist or whomever engages with a piece of public artwork for them to emotionally or mentally prepare themselves for that engagement. So for me, it's always going to bed and waking up with the knowledge that the responsibility of my actions and what I choose to promote, to commission, to include in the jury process has lasting repercussions and could potentially traumatize someone or could bring healing to someone. And, you know, as I touched on earlier, you know, being of indigenous descent, you know, part of my thinking and philosophy is my actions impact seven generations for me. And so acknowledging that while I am not a maker and in, in my current state of existence, you know, this curatorial practice um, and what I'm choosing to nurture in public space has repercussions. And I cannot carry that burden um, lightly. Um, and I think that that is a, a big difference between the spaces that artists creating work for the public occupy and the curators occupy and when we have this discussion about uh, public space and what exists there. I just want to go back and point out, uh, let's talk about what, what Preston said early, you know, early on in my career, uh, my motivation was, was hunger. My motivation was shelter because, you know, I was homeless and living out of my car. Um, and, and what Phoenix is saying about, do I feel some part responsibility towards what I make? Yeah, I, I, I pick and choose what I want to put out there because it represents who I am and what I, what I want to say. And a lot of times it gets to a point where, whereas 
uh, I do feel some responsibility to what I put out there because like what, what Miranda saying, you know, you're, you're tugging at a person's emotional state when they look at our artwork. We are we created of things, you know, and, and we're talking about tearing something down. I think about, again, all the labor that went into the creation of that work. We're all in our studios every day working to create something someone has never seen before. At least that's what I'm trying to do. And so I do feel some lot of responsibility of what I put out there and how it's going to tug at someone's emotion, whether it's political or whether it's in society or it's, you're talking about the environment. There's a lot of things out there that we put ourselves out there when we create things. And I just think it's important that for me as an artist to take some responsibility and be aware of what I put out there and what it says about the work. You know, it's interesting. Um, uh, I've been looking at a lot of doc uh, documents, a lot of panel discussions, and uh, dealing with this subject in pre preparation for today. And some of the some of the quotes that I have that 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 just stuck with me about the whole question about monuments is are you know some like uh, a monument is a monument based on us. Okay, the meaning we subscribe to it is what really makes it a monument and make it so worthy. You know, when we look at these monuments, what are they really? They're objects in space made of raw material that was manipulated by the hands of other human beings. And it's not until we subscribe some type of meaning to it that it starts to actually play within our psyche and really play within um, our deep emotions. Um, and, and that's what I see what a lot of the, these Confederate uh, monument sculptures, statues are, you know, and how they've played within our psyche and emotions because we understand their narrative. And there's questions on, um, on our Facebook page that deals with um, that I want to go ahead and pull up and read real quick uh, so we can have a quick question question and answer from our uh, Facebook. Let's see. Here's a question by Suzanne Ferris. She asked a question. There are so many Confederate monuments. How do we take on all of them? Do we think we can meaningfully complete them all in the way that they have been described? Uh, should should some should some be removed so this process can be focused on fewer in, but a very intentional way, um, which also brings to a question that we hit, we hit on yesterday in our our setup. How are these going to get paid for if we decide to remove all of them? You know, I stated earlier, according to the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, there's 780 monuments. Okay, that are out throughout the United States, that if we do decide to take them all down, one, how are we gonna pay for that? Two, where are they gonna go? And let's say we leave them and we have counter monuments, uh, which goes to another question from uh, Harry McDaniel. How are we gonna pay for those? So what are, what are your thoughts on that? And um, what do, where do we go from, from here? I think when you think about the monuments and who pays for them, right now they're being paid for. So your tax dollars are paying for them. Um, so your tax dollars can continue to pay for them in one form or another. If they get taken down and they go to some nonprofit somewhere, that nonprofit is gonna seek grant money to care for them and again, there's going to be someone's money, private funding or state funding or federal funding, NEA, NEH funding that is going to help pay for them again. Um, so I don't, my, I don't have a concern for the loss of the monuments <laughs> or that somebody somehow is not going to care for the monuments. I think that there's always going to be someone that's caring for them. Um, but the, the new ones, should be funded by tax dollars just as just as much my tax dollars your tax dollars we should fund that and one other way of possibly getting that money 
would be to somewhat defund the police, which is not the most ludicrous idea in the world. So maybe in your defunding of, of the police departments who are, they have too much money. Um, and you can use some of that to, to cover the cost and the upkeep of, 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 of the new monuments and the old monuments. But someone's already budgeted for the old monuments. They've been there for years. They're, they're like a line item in everybody's budget somewhere. Those monuments have been cared for for all these you know, many years and they will continue to be so. So that's, they're the least of my concern in that respect. Yeah, the United States, unless we forget that uh, our ancestors here worked for 300 years for free with hands, bodies, blood, soil, and, and that's those ancestors. And then the, the indigenous folks had to like run away from their waterways and live in like enclosed communities. And then you had some poor white folks, but majority, you know, people were owning us. This is 300 years. Like I actually, I want to use profanity in this moment. Like I don't care. The, the United States is the one of the wealthiest countries in the on the planet. Jeff Bezos himself from us ordering our toothpaste and dog <laughs> food. So, have you walked around how the white folks live? And have you seen the Latinx community or the Chicanx community? Have you walked around each community? Have you gone to San Francisco and seen how people on the streets are mostly Black men, homeless? And then you have wealthy white, that whole entire uh, uh, city. I don't give a shit where the money comes from because white folks in general have their 70% of the population. They have the resources. Black folks are 13% of the population. You know, you, you got the coin. We worked for you to death times 300 years. So the money is there. It doesn't matter. Be advocate. Everyone should be advocating for a reparations package. There's plenty of economists who have already done the math. All we have to do is be aggressive in our advocacy and consistent and demand it and keep demanding it. Maybe not in our lifetime, maybe in our lifetime, who the hell knows, but we need to be very consistent in our demands. The coins are there. It's just floating around. It's going from my pocket to Jeff Bezos for my cat food. It's there. I mean, and so much of this development that gentrifies neighborhoods skates under the percent for art mandates for most cities. So the percent for art is usually like when the city or the county puts a new building in, then that dollar point goes into the art funding. If we applied that to developers who are gentrified, there would be so many millions of dollars to fund whatever public art we wanted to do. You know, it would be difficult to spend it all. You know, and then the communities would have a say so in, you know, yeah, this mid century modern house that my family's lived in, you know, people are coming by trying to give me cash. But, you know, if we all get together, we can make sure we dictate what's in these public spaces and that people coming in and gentrifying these neighborhoods have to pay dues, you know, in order to do it. Um, absolutely. And that goes hand in hand with land back, right? Like it's, you know, time's up. It's been 600 years, y'all. I guess the question still is on the table. What do we do with uh, the existing uh, monuments, uh, you know, that glorify the <laughs> Confederate flag and all of that? I, I, if we would take a vote, oh, I think there's five of us here. I wonder how many of us would say, well, leave them up, you know? And how many would say, tear them down? Is that asking a little, am I causing some trouble here? <laughs> but uh, what do you think? I mean, I haven't heard, heard anything clear yet. I agree with Phoenix, you know, I hate to see them come down for, and like, as, as an artist myself, but, you know, when I went to Vicksburg, I was looking for those statues, those figures, those well-done uh, statues, 
so that I can better understand who these people were. Uh, was uh, in, in Tennessee, Nathan Forrest? Uh, I, I, I want to, I would like to see these things, but at the same time, it really gives me a bad feeling of what they were about and who they were about. But the, isn't that what history does? It doesn't always please you. You're going to get bad, uh, you know, bad feelings about a lot of things that happened in, 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 in history. So where are we? So, so I, I, I just want to say this. Um, one, I think when you were mentioning Pittsburgh, you might have gone to the Civil War Memorial Park, which basically is a park of public sculptures. So, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know who owns it. I think there is a fee. I don't, re I, I've gone years ago. I've not been lately. Um, but you drive around, it's a driving park. You drive around and you see one memorial yeah. after another to the Civil War battle that took place in Pittsburgh and they have certain historical pieces of information or whatever. So I'm thinking that that might be what you saw, Preston. I'm sure in the town they have um, other sculptures, but I feel like that might be what you're, you're referencing. Um, but no, again, I'm for leaving the monuments. There's probably only one monument that I was ever in favor of removed. And it's, you know, sort of after the fact it was already removed when I learned about it. But I don't know how many people know about the good darkie statue. So anyway, <laughs> all right, so let me explain. So the good darkie statue was um, put up in 1926 by a, um, a wealthy white planter in Natchitoches, Louisiana, and he erected a beautiful bronze statue of a black man um, in a rather subservient position, um, bowing with his um, cap, his head tilted in his, you know, sort of his cap in hand, and the um, plaque read something to the effect of this is dedicated to the good darkies of Louisiana for their service and their, you know, dedication and so forth and so forth. So by 1968, um, a bit of a, a civil rights unrest was taking place in, in Natchitoches and someone threatened to bomb the statue. Oh. And so in the middle of the night, um, the uh, powers that be removed the statue. It was stored for a couple of years, but the statue still exists. The statue is on the campus of LSU. Mm -hmm. So it is housed at the uh, Royal Life Center um, on the campus of LSU. It used to greet you when you got to the Royal Life um, camp, um, Center. It used to be right there in the, in the, um, in the roundabout. But they've moved it. And so it's not, again, maybe some sort of um, controversy. But in that sense, that statue really on a daily basis as Black people walked by it, it really was reinforcing this notion of their positionality in the public space. And I hope removing it was beneficial to the you know upliftment of the mentality of, of the community and so I, I i can see where that was very logical to to do these particular uh you know generals on a horse or, or whatever um although i as a black person stop and read every one that i see and and look at it and try to look at it for its 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 making process and, and all of that I, I don't know how many other black people actually stop and look at that thing and, and, and give a damn. I'm sorry. I mean, we're having this great debate about it, but I don't know about the average black person looking at these statues and, and, and feeling some sort of shriveled bewil bewilderingness of, of their sense of self because of that guy on the horse down the road. I, I'm, I'm just not sure that that's, you know, I've never had this conversation about any statue with any other black person <laughs> other than you all right now. <laughs> okay, so are, are, are I, mean, you I that... talk about a lot of shit with my friends, you know, we talk about a lot of stuff, but I'm sorry, monument statues, guys on a horse, having felt, you know, belittled as a black person in society because of the guy on the horse, it has not come up in my 59 years <laughs> of communication until tonight. <laughs> so I say leave them and build some more shit. <laughs> I, think, I think Phoenix, honestly, when you look at all the people who are like the hardest advocates for the removal of the Confederate statues, you'll find a lot of like neoliberal white folks 
because it is very much like a oh my god here's the thing to assuage my white guilt let's remove these statues right and it ends up being very much a like lip service action like you were talking about earlier where there's you know it you know, like we have all these cities that commissioned black lives matter murals right but only nine of them actually moved to reduce or defund their police force in the same year that they were commissioning those black lives matter murals um for me i'm i'm more for ruination you know instead of full removal like i want to see the layers of community action onto those pieces like in my dream world where the stone mountain monument gets its facade blasted off the piece that excites me is leaving the rubble of those faces at the bottom so that the community can engage with the rubble you know because i think the ruination just like we've always romanticized greek and roman you know ruins i think the ruination of the symbols of white supremacy is much more appealing than you know either complete and utter removal or you know, whatever else we may interpret and it's less white guilty assuaging appearing than you know uh the full removal of peace so 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 here's the thing if you put up a counter monument next to a white hegemonic monument you have dismantled it because the whole point of it being there is to it, it it's there to hide me it's there because it's there to hide what they don't want you to see so if i put up a monument that that reflects me or native people or any other one person group that's not you know engaged in in white hegemony then you've no longer hidden me i'm there and i have in essence dismantled your monument because you can't see that monument without seeing me, reading me, reading the context, understanding, looking at the two, using logical, you know, reasoning to realize, oh, well, that shit, that's, that's, that's a crock of shit. And, and being able to, to, to stand in a sense of, of goodness about understanding that. And I would rather see that happen than you know, removing it and, and, and taking it away and no one ever sees it ever again unless you go to a theme park and you know, go to the theme park for Confederate monuments, but you could. Um, and, and, and so the, the thing is, is that it, it needs to stay where it is. It needs to be confronted by its, um, its cohort. Mm -hmm. And that cohort is the inclusion of others in that public art space or that public history space and when you include me in that public history space you have immediately dismantled the notion of white hegemony and that's what i would prefer i mean that's just my take on it of of what would would happen so. you know i can see how complicated this is i mean really <laughs> right now we're, we're talking about it and uh and I mean, what, it's like I'm seeing you, uh, Phoenix, you're, you're saying that, okay, allow this one to exist, but build another one. One, two, three, four, however many, it doesn't matter. <laughs> build, 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 build as many as you want to build and that tells whatever the story is of that community that needs to be told, um, that, that should be done. I mean, I think a lot of communities do that with murals. Um, I like personally, just because I'm a sculptor, I like to see more 3D work. Um, and I was going to say this one thing about the Black Lives Matter um, uh, murals. I, 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 I really, you know, want to applaud them, but they're on the ground and they get run over. I, I don't know. That does something to me that they get run over by cars. I know that sounds silly, but, but just my own sensitive self, that the positionality of this Black Lives Matter that's on the ground that is now going to be, uh, in a sense, decimated by uh, tire, tire uh, tracks is, uh, it's, it's just a little problematic to me. I think in its, you know, initial conception, great idea, great idea, but if you think things through, 
to what is something really saying on that one little nuanced level that cars are going to run over this thing. I know it's just me. It's just probably me. So I just need to put that out there. <laughs> so yeah, I'm done. And this this is a great conversation that we're having. We can, we have a lot of different opinions. Um, my, it's interesting because my take is that if things are supposed to be historical and we're going to use it as a teaching tool, then there are places for that. And there are scenarios and, and plazas and creations of spaces that are for that. Um, to me, understanding the history of a lot of these uh, monuments and statues, they were more like weapon markers. It's like having a tank on a corner or in a plaza just reminding people that, okay, this is what's going to happen if you don't act. So my reaction is always, let's look at the context. If the context now that we want to say that these are to keep them, we need to keep them because they have historical value or they tell a story, then let's set the, the right setting in place to say the story so that we all understand it. Um, they're great looking pieces, but at the same time, they all look the same. 780 sculptures that are, are very similar. They're pretty cookie cutters, you know? So for creativity, mm, not sure about that, you know? So I can, I, you know, if we want to keep a few of them, yes. The rest of them we can use that, we can melt them down, either use them from currency to fund the projects or fund spaces or fund education to re-educate or even use them to Re repurpose them for the materials that the artists want to use to create the new piece that's going to be the, the counterpiece. So that's that's kind of like my view on 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 the pieces and the historical value and, and what they are. But anybody else have any other uh, comments or questions or anything else that they would like to bring up? Because we are actually about uh, 22 minutes past when we said we were going to stop. Um, I am happy and that, um, that MSA has decided to let it, our conversation go uh, because, you know, this is real. This, this affects us. Uh, we might not speak about it every day. And as um, one person said earlier, um, well, actually from a, the document I was, I was looking at, um, Sue Mobley from, she's a research scholar from Monument Lab. She said, the time we learn the most about monuments is when we take them down, which is interesting, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we have, and it's actually to the point that Phoenix, you're, you're bringing up, you know, these are things that are, that have been around. Um, a lot, a lot of people have fought and said, let's get rid of them for ages. And they haven't been, people haven't been listening. But until the actual action um, of quote unquote violence onto the property um, of, of something and the idea of something is when a lot of our psyches wake up and say, hey, what's going on? What's, what, is, what is this really about and what's happening and what do we need to do uh, to, um, to quash the violence and to really now share what the true meaning of these pieces are? Um, I have a suggestion. This is an idea. <laughs> well, of course, everyone knows uh, what should be done. But the gallery or the art, um, what, what, uh, galleries around the United States, uh, institutions, people that commission artwork. I think to destroy the uh, type of racism we, that we've ex experienced in this country for so much, they could give more commissions to black artists. You know what I mean? They can concentrate on giving more shows not just a few black artists, you know, like uh, Andy Warhol did with Basquiat, or you know, to make him some type of quick star, and then they disappear. But they could commission more black artists that aren't that are not afraid to speak out, especially in their work. There was a time when I was coming up in the art world that I had to hide my blackness from my art. I couldn't make anything that referred to Africa or anything like that. And I knew this was true. The entire city, uh, well, living in Chicago all those years, not one representation, not one gallery representation. It took a long time to build what I had. 
Well, that's still alive today. So one way of dealing with this monumental problem is to give more opportunities, you know, uh, to uh, Native American artists, other artists other than white artists. I think that's a that's that's a good solution for us to, to look at, and hopefully, uh, those that are listening that are within those institutions and that have that power are taking uh, these words seriously uh, from from everyone that's here that actually live and make pieces, but also love to share their views and their love for humanity by making the world a better place. So on that note, I'm gonna go ahead, uh, Jason, if it's okay, do the closing remarks. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks right. everybody. Great, great, great discussion. So uh, I wanna say thank you to my panelists, uh, everyone that is listening out there on Facebook and everybody that's gonna be watching this on YouTube in the future. Um, thank you for joining us today on um, this very serious issue. I believe the reality of America is that we are at another juncture of determining who we are as the society. We are at a time where we are battling to re reconcile the past and set course for the future. We are now a more educated society with the plethora of resources at our fingertips. The veil of ignorance is no longer acceptable for the masses. The tearing down of monuments that no longer resonate with those who no longer choose to live in the past is just one way our young and old have chosen to speak out and be heard after decades of bringing these issues to the forefront. Let us not deceive ourselves. If these objects of long past are put into areas of remnants, destroyed, or remain standing defiantly, their fate will be a statement of the society we live in. We all have a role in shaping the pre our present and future, like the artists on this panel that di diligently shape concepts into forms. Maybe it's time for us to stop uh, using history and start writing our story as, true, as a true United Nation. One thing, one last question that I'd like to leave for everybody. What have you done today to make the world a better place? Thank you, everybody. Um, once again, uh, MSA, thanks you for, for listening. Go to our Facebook page or our website and donate if you like. Uh, everything that you've seen, we have further uh, other online panel discussions. Um, Zaveria Simmons, Miranda Kyle, Preston Jackson, Brian Massey, and Phoenix Savage. Thank you very much. I'm I'm fortunate. I am blessed, and I love you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac, and the rest of the panel people. <laughs> Bye.